In the very heart of American entertainment, a radiant star graced the stage, Robin McLaurin Williams. His legacy transcends mere acting. It embodies the essence of joy and the art of narratives. Robin was a maestro of mirth, weaving laughter into every gesture, painting vivid jokes upon the canvas of his imagination. Born with the gift of humor, Robin embarked on his journey amidst the bustling streets of San Francisco and Los Angeles. Each jest, each quip, etched its mark upon the hearts of audiences worldwide. His comedy albums like Reality, What a Concept, became anthems of delight, resonating with the essence of his comedic creativity. But it was on the small screen where Robin truly enraptured audiences, embodying the endearing alien Mork in the beloved sitcom Mork and Mindy. From there, his star ascended, leading to his inaugural leading film roles, a cornerstone in his illustrious cinematic career. Yet Robin's brilliance transcended comedy alone. He ventured into the realm of drama with such finesse that it left critics and audiences spellbound. Beyond the silver screen, Robin's philanthropic spirit shone through in his roles in family-friendly films, leaving an indelible mark on hearts young and old alike. However, behind the facade of laughter and applause lay a man grappling with inner turmoil, a silent battle against the shadows of depression culminating in a tragic end. As we reflect on the life of this comedic legend, we're compelled to ponder what propelled him to such dizzying heights of brilliance, what lurked behind his infectious smile, and perhaps most profoundly, what lessons can we take from his extraordinary journey? Join me on a journey through the art of laughter and tears as we unravel the life of Robin Williams, a personality whose legacy continues to inspire and illuminate, reminding us of the power of laughter in the face of adversity. In the heart of Chicago, at St. Luke's Hospital, a spark of genius was born on July 21st, 1951. Robin McLaurin Williams entered the world, destined to leave an indelible mark on the realm of entertainment. His roots were deeply embedded in a lineage of distinction. His father, Robert Fitzgerald Williams, a luminary in Ford's Lincoln Mercury division, and his mother, Laurie McLaurin, a former model with a lineage tracing back to Mississippi's political legacy. Growing up, Robin was enveloped in a rainbow of influences. His mother's laughter was his compass, guiding him toward the shores of comedy. While his peers saw a quiet child, beneath that facade lay a budding humorist waiting to bloom. It wasn't until he discovered the stage in high school that his true brilliance unfurled like a hidden treasure. In 1963, a seismic shift altered the course of his life. His family's relocation to suburban Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, ushered in a new chapter. Here, amidst the tranquility of a 40-room farmhouse, Robin thrived at Detroit Country Day School. He wasn't just a student, he was a force of nature, excelling in academics, leading his classmates as class president and grappling with opponents on the wrestling mat. He demonstrated a versatility that hinted at the multifaceted talent yet to be unleashed. The years rolled by, marked by laughter, triumphs and the occasional stumble. Through it all, Robin's spirit remained resilient, fueled by the memories of his mother's laughter and the applause of his peers. And in the household of the Williams family, young Robin found solace in the company of the family's maid. She became his guiding light, a constant presence in his formative years. As his parents toiled away, it was she who filled the void, shaping his early experiences and fostering a sense of companionship that would stay with him for years to come. That at the tender age of 16, Robin's life took yet another dramatic turn. His father bid farewell to the corporate world, embracing early retirement, and whisked the family away to the sun-kissed shores of Tiburon, California. Here, amidst the beauty of their new surroundings, Robin embarked on a new chapter, enrolling at Redwood High School in nearby Larkspur. High school was a whirlwind of laughter and uncertainty for Robin. Despite his quick wit and infectious humor, his peers viewed him through a lens of skepticism. Voted most likely not to succeed and funniest by his classmates upon graduation in 1969, Robin stood at a mixed thoughts for the spotlight. With dreams of the stage dancing in his mind, he set aside his mixed thoughts and ventured into the world of acting. Entering Claremont Men's College in Claremont, California became his initial destination, where he dabbled in the study of political science before realizing his true calling lay elsewhere. The College of Marin emerged as Robin's sanctuary, 
a haven where his talent flourished and his spirit soared. Immersed in the world of theatre for three transformative years, he honed his craft, leaving audiences spellbound with his improvisational genius. James Dunn, the esteemed drama professor, recognised Robin's unparalleled potential, foreseeing a future filled with stardom. And in 1973, fate intervened once more, as Robin secured a coveted scholarship to the prestigious Juilliard School in New York City. Amongst a select cohort of 20 students, he stood out as a beacon of creativity and boundless energy. Alongside stars like Christopher Reeve, William Hurt and Mandy Patinkin, Robin's personality continued to rise, leaving an indelible mark on all who crossed his path. Christopher Reeve fondly recalled their early days at Juilliard, where Robin's vibrant personality lightened every room he entered. With his tie-dyed shirts and infectious enthusiasm, he embodied a spirit of boundless potential, an untamed force of nature destined for greatness. In 1976, Robin Williams ventured into the world of stand-up comedy, finding his calling amidst the bustling energy of the San Francisco Bay Area. His first stage, the Holy City Zoo, a cosy comedy club nestled in the heart of San Francisco. But Robin's journey to the spotlight wasn't a direct route. He started from the bottom, tending bar and soaking in the laughter and applause from afar. San Francisco in the 1960s and 70s was a melting pot of creativity and revolution, a hub of rock music, hippies and a burgeoning comedy scene. Critics like Gerald Nachman hailed this era as a comedy renaissance and Robin Williams was at the forefront, igniting stages with his unmatched wit and infectious energy. But amidst the laughter, Robin also grappled with the darker side of fame, confronting the allure of drugs and the fleeting nature of happiness. As the curtains rose on a new chapter, Robin made the leap to Los Angeles, where he continued to hone his craft at iconic venues like the Comedy Store. It was here in 1977 that fate intervened in the form of TV producer George Schlatter. Recognising Robin's raw talent, Schlatter extended an invitation to appear on a revival of his acclaimed show, Laugh-In. This televised debut marked a milestone in Robin's burgeoning career, thrusting him into the spotlight and setting the stage for what was to come. But television fame was just the beginning. In the same year, Robin dazzled audiences with a show at the LA Improv, captivating viewers with his unparalleled improvisational skills. While the Laugh-In revival may have faltered, it served as a springboard for Robin's television career, propelling him into the homes and hearts of millions across the nation. Yet, amidst the happenings in Hollywood, Robin remained grounded, returning to his roots at comedy clubs like the Roxy to sharpen his comedic edge. Across the pond in England, he continued to spread laughter and joy, captivating audiences at venues like the Fighting Cox with his magnetic stage presence. David Letterman, a fellow comedian and longtime friend, vividly recalls the moment he first witnessed Robin's comedic brilliance at the comedy store. It was like a bolt of lightning, electrifying the room and leaving Letterman in awe, fearing for his own place in the cutthroat world of show business. While Robin's silver screen debut in the 1977 comedy, Can I Do It? Till I Need Glasses, may have been modest. Performing an unnatural act on a Polish plumbing contractor, going 60 miles an hour up and down the steps of the Washington Monument on the night of July 14th. His true breakout came with the iconic role of Popeye in 1980. Despite the film's lukewarm reception, Robin's performance as the spinach-loving sailor proved his acting chops beyond a doubt, drawing on the same magnetic energy that had captivated audiences on television. Hey, your mother's here? So what? You bet I'm Pleased to meet you, ma'am. I'm a mother myself. That's his mother. I can't bust when I was his mother. Hey! Following his stint on the Laugh-In revival and a memorable appearance on The Richard Pryor Show, Robin's meteoric rise continued with his portrayal of the eccentric alien Mork in a 1978 episode of Happy Days. Gary Marshall, the show's creator, was initially hesitant about casting Robin, but one unforgettable audition changed everything. When asked to take a seat, Robin instead opted to sit on his head, a move that perfectly encapsulated his offbeat humour and undeniable charm. 
As Mork, Robin's improvisational genius took center stage, infusing the character with his trademark high-pitched voice and boundless energy. The cast, crew and network executives were spellbound by his performance, swiftly offering him a contract before any competitors could swoop in. Robin Williams' portrayal of Mork on Happy Days struck a chord with audiences, catapulting him to stardom. So much so that it birthed the beloved sitcom Mork and Mindy, where Williams starred alongside Pam Dorber. From 1978 to 1982, viewers tuned in week after week, enchanted by Robin's boundless energy and unparalleled improvisation. Set in present-day Boulder, Colorado, the show was a departure from its nostalgic predecessor, yet it retained the same heart and humor that endeared audiences to Mork. With a staggering weekly audience of 60 million, Mork and Mindy transformed Robin Williams into a household name, cementing his status as a superstar. For young fans, Robin was more than just a comedian. He was a source of endless inspiration and imagination. Critics hailed him as a man-child, his rubber-faced antics and endless stream of ideas captivating hearts and minds alike. Mork's popularity transcended the small screen, gracing everything from posters to lunchboxes, a testament to Robin's enduring appeal. Mayday! 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 All systems overload! Fall back defense line B! Prepare for assault system! You show me yours, I'll show you mine. Never! Never! never. The pinnacle of Robin's rise to fame came with his appearance on the cover of Time magazine on March 12, 1979. Captured in a candid moment by photographer Michael Dressler, the photo showcased Robin's multifaceted persona, the funny man and the introspective soul, etched in the annals of history. This iconic image now resides in the National Portrait Gallery, a poignant reminder of Robin's legacy. Following the triumph of Mork and Mindy, Robin Williams expanded his comedic empire, captivating audiences with his stand-up routines throughout the late 1970s and into the 1980s. His comedic genius was on full display in three HBO specials, Off the Wall in 1978, An Evening with Robin Williams in 1983, and A Night at the Met in 1986. Beyond the stage, Williams ventured into the realm of cinema, taking on the leading role in The World According to Garp in 1982. While the film may have lacked the frenetic energy of his comedic performances, Williams brought depth and sincerity to his portrayal of Garp, earning praise from critics like Roger Ebert. What do you mean she has no tongue? I mean she has no tongue. It was cut off. Oh, Christ, I'm sorry. It was cut off on purpose because of what happened to a little girl named Ellen James. Despite the success of Garp, Williams found himself navigating through smaller roles in films like The Survivors, 1983, what do I think? Well, I think that I could tell whoever I want, whatever I want, whenever I want. And I don't want to hear about what you want. And Club Paradise, 1986, which failed to propel his film career to new heights. Chicago fireman retired. That's interesting. Oh, there's a smashing yacht club in Chicago. Um, Belmont Harbor. Well, you see, yachting's a little tough in Chicago because they tend to shoot at you from the South Shore but it was his breakthrough role in Barry Levinson's Good Morning Vietnam in 1987 that truly catapulted Williams to cinematic stardom. Portraying the irreverent radio DJ Adrian Cronauer, Williams breathed life into the character with his signature improvisational style. Set against the backdrop of the Vietnam War, Williams' portrayal captivated audiences as he delivered a barrage of comedic impressions from Walter Cronkite to Elvis Presley with unparalleled flair. Producer Mark Johnson marveled at Williams' improvisational genius, allowing the cameras to roll as the comedic maestro worked his magic, crafting new moments with every take. Through his uninhibited creativity, Williams breathed new life into the role, earning acclaim and a nomination for the Academy Award for Best Actor. Ready and the Dreamers! The wrong speed. We've got it on the wrong speed. For those of you who are recovering from a hangover, that's going to sound just right. Memorable roles in films like Mrs. Doubtfire and... Found this outside. Uh, yes, this is off my uh, Mercedes. Oh, dear. Well, they say a man who has to buy a big car like that's trying to compensate for smaller genitals, is he? Patch Adams showcased his ability to evoke laughter and tears in equal measure. Be kisses. <laughs> <laughs> oh 
but it was his portrayal of a private school English teacher in Dead Poet Society in 1989 that truly left a lasting impression. The film's emotional finale struck a chord with audiences, inspiring a generation and cementing its place in pop culture. No matter what anybody tells you, words and ideas can change the world. Now see that look in Mr. Pitt's eye, like 19th century literature has nothing to do with going to business school or medical school. Similarly, William's performance as a therapist in Good Will Hunting in 1997 resonated deeply with both audiences and real therapists alike. His ability to infuse empathy and warmth into his characters left a profound impact on those who watched. How'd it go? It was good. Going out again? I don't know. Why not? I haven't called her. Christ, you're an amateur. In Awakenings in 1990, Williams embodied the role of a doctor inspired by the renowned neurologist Oliver Sacks. Sacks himself praised Williams' portrayal, describing his approach as a form of genius. Leonard, every patient on this ward thinks there's a plot against him. Yeah, well, they're mistaken. They're crazy. <laughs> In 1991, Williams took on the iconic role of an adult Peter Pan in Hook, showcasing his versatility once again. Director Terry Gilliam, who collaborated with Williams on multiple films, praised his ability to seamlessly transition between manic energy and tender vulnerability. In 1992, Robin Williams lent his voice to the beloved character of the genie in the animated classic Aladdin. Interestingly, the role was specifically written with Williams in mind, a testament to his iconic status in Hollywood. Initially hesitant to accept the role due to his reservations about Disney profiting from merchandise sales, Williams eventually agreed with certain conditions. He saw it as an opportunity to be part of the rich tradition of animation and to create something for his children. One of his conditions was not to endorse any products related to the film, such as Burger King toys or merchandise. Once on board, Williams brought his trademark improvisational flair to the role, recording an astounding 30 hours of dialogue. He seamlessly transitioned between voices, impersonating a multitude of celebrities from Ed Sullivan to Arnold Schwarzenegger. Williams's portrayal of the genie became one of his most iconic and beloved performances, elevating Aladdin to become the highest grossing film of 1992. His voice work garnered critical acclaim, earning him a special Golden Globe Award for vocal work in a motion picture. Beyond its commercial success, Williams' involvement in Aladdin marked a turning point in animated films paving the way for more star-powered voice casts. In recognition of his contributions to Disney and the world of entertainment, Williams was honored as a Disney legend in 2009. Through his unforgettable performance as the genie, Robin Williams left an indelible mark on audiences of all ages, reminding us of the magic of storytelling and the power of imagination. In 1994, Disney and Robin Williams found themselves at odds over the use of the genie character in advertising for Aladdin. Feeling betrayed, Williams refused to lend his voice to the direct-to-video sequel, The Return of Jafar, where the role of the genie went to Dan Castellaneta. However, when Joe Roth took over as chairman of Walt Disney Studios, he extended a public apology to Williams for the breach of agreement. This gesture of reconciliation prompted Williams to reprise his role as the genie in the second sequel, Aladdin and the King of Thieves, in 1996. Beyond his comedic roles, Williams delved into dramatic performances, leaving audiences spellbound with films like Moscow on the Hudson in 1984. Yesterday, I bought my first pair of American shoes. They were made in Italy. Must have, huh? You got it. Today, I opened my own restaurant. What Dreams May Come in 1998. I'm sorry for all the things I'll never give you. I'll never buy you another meatball sub with extra sauce. And Bicentennial Man in 1999. The two bodies can become so mixed up that you don't know who's who or what's what. And just when the sweet confusion is so intense you think you're going to die. As the early 2000s dawned, Williams embarked on a new chapter in his career, exploring darker and more complex roles. 
This evolution showcased a newfound depth to his versatility as an actor, challenging both himself and audience expectations. In a memorable cameo, alongside Billy Crystal in a 1997 episode of Friends, Williams demonstrated his comedic prowess once again, leaving viewers in stitches with his unscripted antics. In the 2002 film Insomnia, Williams took on a chilling role as a murderer, evading a sleep-deprived detective, portrayed by Al Pacino amidst the stark landscapes of rural Alaska. This departure from his comedic roots showcased Williams' versatility as an actor, delving into darker and more complex characters. I think that Kay was getting scared. I probably have myself to blame for that. Why is that? Uh, Randy knew who I was, not, not who I was, but knew that she had a friend, someone she could confide in, and that made him furious. That same year, Williams delivered a haunting performance in One Hour Photo, playing an emotionally disturbed photo technician who becomes fixated on a family he has developed pictures for over time. You would never neglect and abuse your children. Make horrible demands of your children. In 2004, Williams' comedic prowess was recognized when he secured the 13th spot on Comedy Central's esteemed list of 100 greatest stand-ups of all time. This accolade solidified his status as one of the most beloved and influential comedians in history. In 2006 alone, he graced the silver screen in five diverse movies, showcasing his remarkable range as an actor. From the political satire of Man of the Year to the gripping thriller The Night Listener, Williams effortlessly captivated audiences with his captivating performances. In May 2013, CBS launched The Crazy Ones, a new series starring Williams, which unfortunately met its end after just one season. Despite the setback, Williams continued to leave his mark on the big screen. His poignant portrayal of Henry Altman in The Angriest Man in Brooklyn, released during his lifetime, showcased his versatility as an actor as he grappled with life's complexities Tommy, by the time you see this, I'll be dead. Cut! What? Uh, how do I turn it on? Oh, that's the fucking record button. Check. And action. Tragically, Williams' passing in 2014 did not mark the end of his cinematic journey. Several films, including Night at the Museum, Secret of the Tomb, A Merry Friggin' Christmas, Boulevard, and Absolutely Anything were released posthumously, ensuring that his legacy continued to resonate with audiences long after his departure. In June 1978, Robin Williams tied the knot with Valerie Velardi after a period of living together. Their love story began in 1976 when they crossed paths at a San Francisco tavern where Williams worked as a bartender. Their joy multiplied with the arrival of their son, Zachary Pym, Zach Williams, in 1983, adding an extra layer of happiness to their lives. However, life took its turns, and in 1988, Williams and Velardi parted ways. Reports surfaced about Williams' involvement with Zachary's nanny, Marsha Garces, starting in 1986. Yet Velardi clarified in the 2018 documentary, Robin Williams, come inside my mind, that the relationship with Garces began post-separation. On April 30th, 1989, Williams exchanged vows with Garces, who was expecting their first child. Their family expanded with the births of Zelda Ray Williams in 1989 and Cody Allen Williams in 1991. Unfortunately, their marital journey faced turbulence, leading to Garces filing for divorce in March 2008, which was finalized in 2010. In the next chapter of his life, Williams found love once more. He walked down the aisle with graphic designer Susan Schneider on October 22, 2011, in St. Helena, California. The couple settled in Seacliff, San Francisco, where Williams cherished the presence of his children, finding immense wonder in watching them grow into remarkable individuals. Then comes a somber day in Paradise Cay, California, tragedy struck as Robin Williams was discovered lifeless in his home on August 11, 2014. The devastating news rippled through the world, leaving many in shock and mourning.